And this morning's panel uh, will just carry on uh, the excellent uh, presentation that we've presentations that we've heard so far this morning. Uh, before I introduce uh, the panel, I wanted to set up a little bit uh, what we're talking about, which is the emergency manager uh, program uh, and its potential for Detroit, and particularly how that relates to privatization of public services. Um, and so a lot of what we will hear on the panel this morning uh, will have to do with the ways that moving to a more hierarchical model could or would not make the financial governance of the city more efficient and how it might improve uh, the economy of the city. But as we're listening to this discussion, and, and I take no position on whether that would or would not work as a matter of economics, it's also worth remembering that financial efficiency is one value, and it's a necessary one, but it's not the only value that we look for in urban governance. There are values that are sometimes more important than just building jobs or balancing a budget. I was talking recently with Lamar Lemons, who is the president of the Detroit Public Schools Board of Education. The Detroit Board, uh, Public Schools Board of Education has no power. They don't run any schools. Um, and I asked him why did he continue to meet with his board twice a month, essentially as a volunteer? What motivated him? And he said, you know, I, um, I wanted to make sure that I did something for my city because when Rosa Parks died, she lacked her full rights to vote. She lacked the right to vote for how her schools would be run. And he took that personally. That, that message, that motivation is in a lot of people for various reasons, for their own personal reasons, that do not have to do with money. Mr. Lemons didn't say, well, it really bothered me that Rosa Parks died when the school district had a deficit. Right. So we are going to hear today about a variety of ways that uh, the economics of emergency management could be improved or uh, different efficiencies that can be obtained from the move towards the more hierarchical model and some of those uh, might or might not work uh, and there's no disputing that the financial emergency requires some kind of solution and if there is a, if there is one out there we should all be open to that but as we listen let's also keep in mind that there are these non-materialist values that even once we agree on some efficient solution to the financial situation that doesn't mean it's necessarily the, the, the number one solution okay let me now introduce the panelists uh, we have dr. Eric Scorsoni he has extensive knowledge on emergency managers and participated in training emergency managers. Uh, he worked as the senior economist at the Michigan Senate Fiscal Agency in 2010, and he has returned to Michigan State University in 2011 as an extension specialist. Prior to returning to Michigan in 2005, uh, Dr. Scorsoni developed award-winning extension programs as an ex assistant extension professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Kentucky uh, in the areas of rural health economics and economic development. He also served as an economist for the Colorado Governor's Office of State Planning and Budget and as a senior economist for the city of Aurora, Colorado. He received his PhD in state and local public finance from Colorado State University. He received his master's degree from Michigan State University welcome anyway, and a BBA from Loyola University of Chicago. He also has also worked on international development projects in Thailand, Macedonia, and Indonesia, and has taught at the University of Bologna, Italy, and University of Valencia, Spain, in public performance management. He has published uh, in State and Local Government Review, Growth and Change, Journal of Appalachian Studies, Economic Development Quarterly, Journal of Federal Studies, Public Money and Management, and International Review of Administrative Sciences. Dr. Scorsi Dr. Scorsoni is from Saginaw, Michigan, and currently resides in DeWitt. Uh, Michael Stamfler is an expert in city management. He served as the emergency manager in Pontiac and led efforts to restructure uh, the city departments there, reducing the annual deficit. Mr. Stampler has also held positions as city manager in Talladega, Alabama, Castleberry, Florida, and Portage, Michigan. In Portage, Stampler privatized water sewer utility operations, saving ratepayers $750,000 annually. 
Mr. Stampler is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Distinguished Budget Award and Certificate of Achievement in Financial Reporting. He is currently the managing principal at his consulting firm, Civic Quest LLC. He holds a BA from Hope College and master's degrees in international studies and public relations from Western Michigan University. Uh, Dr. Linda, Linda Kabulian is lecturer in public policy at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Her research and teaching focus on multi-stakeholder problem-solving processes around workplace and public policy issues. She works with labor, management, and community groups around improved organizational performance and service to diverse communities. She has a number of projects in public education and the water industry. Her new book, Win-Win, Labor Management Collaboration in Education, was published this year. She co-authored Working Better Together, a practical guide for union leaders, elected officials, and managers, and the Concord Handbook, distilling several years of field work about organizations that bridge racial, ethnic, and class divides. While she now serves as a neutral mediator, she was an elected officer and chief bargainer of a union and a senior manager in the federal government. She has also served in the state and local and nonprofit sectors. Dr. Kabulian received her PhD from the University of Michigan. Council member Santil Jenkins was elected to Detroit City Council in November 2009 in her first attempt at elective office. Uh, Ms. Jenkins currently serves as chair of the Planning and Economic Development Committee and the City Council Rules Special Committee. She is also a trustee for the general retirement system. Prior to her election to council in November 2009, she served as director of the residential treatment program at Mariner's Inn a shelter and treatment center for men who are homeless and drug addicted, but who are determined to, to put their lives back together and become contributing members of society. Ms. Jenkins also has worked at the street level as a social worker helping troubled youth and adults turn around their lives. Prior to her work at Mariner, Mariner's Inn, uh, Ms. Jenkins was a national business development director for Platform Learning, a private education company that provides free tutoring to low-income children in underperforming school districts. Before her entry into the private sector, she served six years as a policy analyst and chief of staff to the legendary Marianne Mahaffey while Mahaffey was president of Detroit City Council. She then earned her bachelor's and master's degree in social work from Wayne State University, where she finished at the top of her class. Some of her awards and recognitions are Crane's Detroit Business Women to Watch, Michigan Front Page 30 Honorees, American Association of University Women 12th Annual Women's Summit, Michigan Chronicle Women of Excellence, and Women of Wayne State University Alumni Association Headliners Award. So welcome all of you. We will begin this morning with Dr. Scorsoni. Good morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to echo Justin's comments. I think governance matters and that it is a value of equal importance to financial efficiency. Even though I will be talking about finances and financial efficiency, I've really spending my career kind of understanding the interrelationship between those values and, and how they affect each other. So I want to say that although I'm focusing on the finances, I think he's absolutely right that we have to look at both, both sides, absolutely. Oops, all right, how do I advance? <laughs> so, I think it's important to step back and say, you know, there's a lot of talk there's a financial crisis in the city of Detroit, and not just the city of Detroit, there are many other cities in Michigan that face significant challenges. But really, what, um, what does that really mean? And I think diving into it a little bit is important to understand the context, because I think the solutions are gonna depend on where we've been. And, and it's not, you know, really Detroit's issues go back, actually, you could really argue all the way back to the 1960s. Um, and I'm writing a book right now, um, A Fiscal History of the Motor City, which is really looking at the fact that it's, the challenges are long seated. In fact, there was a report from Wayne State University in 1960 that predicted Detroit would face serious problems from its pension system. Uh, and they really underestimated, actually, how significant it might be. And so there have been challenges all the way back. And um, 
And I think that's important to understand as we look at what are the solutions. And really, I put this up here only because the basic equation matters, that the tax revenue you can raise has to be enough to cover your costs. Now, that's different because the state government does channel how much tax revenue you can raise. There are property tax limitations, there are uh, limitations on income taxes, so it's not, a, you know, you can't just do whatever you want, at least by, you know, every state has different rules, of course. Federal and state aid, mandated spending, you know, what is mandated, that can be maybe debated, but, um, and then other revenues. And so really you have to balance these things. And to simplify it, the available revenue and your reserves, you know, your checking and savings account have to be enough to cover what you need to spend. You know, in that sense, it isn't that different from a household. Um, it is different. The federal government, I want to say, is different because it prints money. And, you know, city governments, uh, they did try and do some of that actually in the Depression, but, but now we don't generally do that. Um, and, and that a fiscal crisis that we're talking about right now, which is an immediate cash crisis of, you know, you're going to run out of money, how are you going to pay the bills? Um, we, we shouldn't be only focused on that because Detroit and many other cities, Flint, another one I'm working in, face long-term problems. Even if we fix the problem today, the problems are continuing to compound themselves over time. So you have to look at short and long-term to really fix the problem. And I would argue the financial control boards of New York and Washington and Philadelphia did not do that. In fact, there's very clear evidence that the financial control board of New York just scolded Mayor Bloomberg, in fact, because he took money out of the uh, retirement health care accounts to balance the budget. And, and so, you know, those processes may work for short term, but we still haven't found the real solution for chronic stress. So as I said, you know, there is an acute fiscal stress and of course you have to address it because if you can't pay your bills, um, then, then some significant consequences may occur. Um, that's not to deny that reality, but it's also to recognize that we have to look at the long term as well. What causes stress? Um, and, and this is, you know, there's a very long literature all the way back to when New York City was in trouble in 75, that started building here. There, there are external conditions that occur. You know, clearly in Detroit, that's evident. I mean, the loss of business, the loss of population, all of those things are going to reduce your tax base, obviously. Uh, unfavorable state and federal policies. You know, federal and state policies have fluctuated over time. In Michigan, they've clearly been a negative factor for city governments. Um, we have reduced state aid going all the way back to 2001. Um, Federal policies have fluctuated plus and minus, but probably now with austerity, more on the negative side, quite frankly. Um, and the other side of it is fragmented politics. I mean, and clearly in New York's case, you know, it's a great example because there, yes, they took on a lot of spending responsibilities. Um, and also, you could argue there were some poor management decisions and things made at the same time to compound the problem. And so these things operate, it's very hard to disentangle them. I would say as an academic, as a researcher, it is not something we can easily disentangle and say it was this or it was that, okay? All we know is what the numbers show us. What caused that is very hard to determine, honestly. So let's look at some of the numbers. Cash on hand. Detroit was generally running between 2004 and 2007, 2008 with about 300, 400 million dollars. Not, that's not bad for a $3 billion enterprise. Then in 2009, 10, and 11, the numbers began to go in the wrong direction. And now, as of the end of 11, it was $100 million. That is not much. It sounds like a lot, of course, to any of us, but it's not a lot of money for a $3 billion city government. And that is why we now face a situation, according to current projections, of a, of a cash deficit. Now, a cash deficit, if it's one month or two, two months can be managed. If it's, you know, prolonged, it becomes very problematic. And, you know, let's be clear, this is what happened to New York and Philadelphia, and they were shut out of the credit markets. They were not able to access capital, and so they, ran, they were running out of money. And so 
Um, and, and that's exactly what, you know, unfortunately Detroit is facing and other cities. Flint certainly is facing that, Inkster, uh, and others as well. So it's not unique necessarily to Detroit. Detroit taxes, I mean, again, di diving into this a little bit, what really happened here? Property taxes were pretty stable until about 08, 09, and then they began to fall. Um, Detroit is somewhat unique. It doesn't necessarily rely as much on property taxes as other cities. The income tax has been hit for a number of years. That's not unexpected. It has come back, actually, in the 2011 audit. Income taxes were up. So we, and I've seen that across the board. All the cities in Michigan that have an income tax have generally seen an increase this last year. State aid has declined. Um, the big factor, quite frankly, is the casino tax. That has saved Detroit over the last decade. Without that, the situation would be far worse. So unfortunately, that grew a lot, and then it's now been stable. So probably wasn't providing as much of a boost in the last couple of years as it did in the first part of the decade. I apologize, this might be a bit hard to read here, but basically spending has exceeded revenues for the last six, seven years. I mean, that's the bottom line. That's why the cash is, is almost gone. You can only do this for so long with your reserves. And this, if you total out these deficits, it's about $500 million. So you burned, you know, the equivalent of close to $500 million in cash. Okay. Um, the cash on hand I reported was truly just cash. There are investments that can be transferred into cash, so the, you have to be careful in comparing that. But, you know, that's essentially what happened. They burned through $500 million over the last six years. Spending has come down in Detroit, but not fast enough, unfortunately. The revenues declined faster than spending. Detroit also engaged in some financial transactions, pension obligation bonds, and you can argue the merit of doing that kind of thing, but it converted what was one kind of cost into a fixed debt cost. And that's, that, so the spending went down, but it popped up somewhere else, and debt service, for example. Um, and so unfortunately, that has been the reality. Spending has not been able to be addressed at the same reduced rate as revenues. And spending is a fixed cost in many ways. As I said, mandated spending, pensions, you must pay, uh, health care costs, you know, all of these costs become very problematic potentially, and it's not easy to get them down. You know, it really is very challenging to say pensions are protected by the Michigan Constitution, health care is protected in union agreements. You know, all of these costs is very hard in city governments, I can tell you, doing it, I, I mean, I'm doing this in many cities now, is it's not easy to get costs down. You know, you can cut you know, well, we won't buy as much. Well, that's fine, but there's only so much of that you can do, okay? And there, there are limits, and that is, that is challenging in this environment then. Uh, beyond the cash, though, there's a, we use a f in government accounting net assets. This includes all of your total long-term liabilities, your pensions, your retiree health care, although I will say this only includes what has accumulated in retiree health care obligations. It is not the, the full 30-year obligation, which is over $5 billion. So what you see here, and this is what happened in 2009, the uh, Government Accounting Standards Board said you must recognize retiree health care on your balance sheet, because they had never done this before. And so basically governments made decisions about retiree health care with no impact on the balance sheet whatsoever. They did not know what it was costing them to do this until 2008. So you can see what happened. Net assets dropped dramatically because there's a new big liability on your balance sheet. So now Detroit, you know, it is running a $200 million deficit as of 2011 end of year, but actually the de net assets are negative $1.4 billion. Okay, that's the real scale of the chronic problem. The $200 million the cash is the short-term problem. The 1.4 billion negative, that's the real chronic problem that's going to have to be addressed as well. Yeah, this is basically the difference between total assets, all assets, and total liabilities, including all long-term liabilities. I will say this is, this is, and this is relevant to privatization actually, 
This number is essentially taking out the what we call restricted assets. Restricted assets would be things that are meant for something else. And that would include the roads, because we, we put a value on the roads, for example. Okay, now I don't think you can sell the roads, but you know, you can do toll roads, okay, but probably not in a city per se. Um, other assets could be prioritized, maybe, maybe not, but, but it gets tricky as to what can and actually be privatized, sold, or marketized, okay? I mean, people have gotten creative, but this is taking that out. So again, that, that's one issue that could be addressed, I suppose, but by traditional accounting standards, I'm not doing it. Only partly because that only includes about uh, 500 million of it. It's actually the total 30-year liability is 5 billion. This is only counting the money that's actually been ac accumulated. It's, it's tricky to understand, but let me just end with this. Basically, you have a deficit, short-term and long-term, and these are the basic four options. More revenue, more borrowing, which is gonna be very difficult without state or federal assistance now or reducing spending, or deferring spending, which is already being done, quite frankly. You're already doing that. And I will just say that with the Financial Control Board idea, again, I have not seen these address chronic fiscal stress, only acute fiscal stress. And so that, that can be a real problem if these mechanisms are put in place. Are, are we going to be able to address short and long term? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scorsoni and Mr. Stamfler. Thank you very much. I uh, had the opportunity as a practitioner to um, work in sort of the opposite end from maybe Dr. Scorsoni in some of these aspects because actually the job was given to me to try to help Pontiac through Public Act 72 and then Public Act 4. So I served as uh, what's known as maybe the receiver now, uh, the emergency manager, for some 14 months. And I would say that the overall impression that I would like to leave people with here today is that really Public Act 4 does not work. And I think it is a fallacy that we have and for some of the same reasons maybe Dr. Scorsoni indicated, it really does not address the long-term situation. I think in Michigan we can see from the number of communities that have what I called recycled through Public Act 72 and then now Public Act 4 soon, communities that have lived this crisis once to come out of the situation for only a short time and re-enter or recycle in back into that situation. And we know the communities E-Cores, uh, many of the communities Flint, they're all sort of teetering on the same situation over and over and over again. And I see nothing from practical experience that allows that cycle to be changed. And having said that, I want to assure you that we worked very diligently to try to change that, but there are only so many cuts and only so much revenue reduction, expenditure reduction rather, that can be done. That's not the whole part of the equation. And I would argue, one of the other impressions that I want to leave with you is that actually the system that we're working under right now, I think, does more to damage civic capital, which is the capacity for governance within the community. Because, for example, it casts aside the mayor and the council for maybe five years. And yes, we can have certain duties that maybe they can attend to or ribbon cuttings or what have you. But then to try to say at the end of that period, well, here's your city back, run it. 
is um, crazy. So civic capital is a very great concern that I observed during my time in Pontiac as having no method prescribed in the public act for how to build that or attend to that. The, most of the nomenclature and the particulars in the act refer always to this financial drive to get revenues and expenses back in order. And it's virtually impossible to do that under the current situation. And so you end up really, I think, causing a great deal of damage and again, furthering this possibility of recycling. So in common parlance, I think it amounts to kicking the can down the road. So, just one other impression. Privatization, I have used privatization in many communities during my career. But what it starts out as, I think, privatization can work if you're really rather sophisticated, I think, about the oversight management abilities and so on that you're going to create. You're going to improve those abilities through this privatization. But let us not kid ourselves. Private operations fail sometimes as well as public operations fail. So the same situations that are in effect when a public organization is running, for example, a water sewer utility, if they're not watching the store and problems are created, when it's privatized, if no one's watching them, the same problems can happen. And we have to be very wary of that. So the ownership of a utility whether it's publicly operated or privately done, has to be very closely guarded and watched. There's no mechanism in Public Act 4 to create that sort of watchfulness or that management oversight. There's no improvement from when the locals are doing it to privatizing it, and indeed, Everything done during this period of management or of emergency management can be undone. So I really believe that it's very difficult to look for improvements in these kind of distressed communities with no change in the civic structure or the organizational structure that's really going to allow that to happen. I would also leave an impression that in many cases, I think that the federal operations are very much at cross purposes with what has to happen in these essentially distressed communities. And I look at the very, uh, just as a basic, HUD policies, which are developed from the 1970s are still being played out today after all the different change in landscape and particularly in these financially distressed communities. They're still applying the same rules with billions of dollars behind it and it really hurts. It hurts the communities. There needs to be some pliability and recognition that the situation is very different in certain communities. And what works in Ann Arbor or Kalamazoo or wherever may not be the ticket for a community that's already down on its knees. There are maybe different ways that the money needs to be spent to help in concert with the state build that community back. And that's not being done. And there's no, nothing on the horizon. You know, I wrote to the uh, Secretary of HUD and begged him, for example, to change certain aspects so that we in that city, Pontiac, could 
address more specific difficulties occurring in that community. And that was in vain. But there are other policies of that nature, too. So my time is nearly up, but I would just say those are my impressions from practitioner in the street. Uh, one could say it's a very great a rude awakening, perhaps, for a practitioner, but I think the other thing is that it, the only impressions that I really have are ones that the, the overall failure of this is very difficult to see how it will change without huge changes in the legislation that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Stampler. And uh, Dr. Linda Kabulian. Well, I think I know what the headline is going to be um, <laughs> after that presentation. Uh, I'm very honored to be here while you consider the future of Detroit. I love cities. I grew up in the Bronx. Um, and I have a special place in my heart for Detroit. I taught here for a very short time when I was at the U of M. And the cultural and human assets and richness of the city wow me. Uh, they always have, and they, they, they did yesterday when I spent the day touring around. Now, I suspect I was invited to uh, speak here because I wrote things like these two booklets, which I'm not pushing, um, but they are free on my website, and I'll give you my website at the end of my presentation. Oh, in fact, that reminds me, I should um, pull up my, my little PowerPoint. Do you, do you have a little mouse? Ah, we have a little mouse, right. Sorry about that. I'm doing this so that I can pull up the PowerPoint. Um, let's see. Let, um, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about me before I make my remarks. Um, I spent 25 years working to change the focus of municipal labor relations. Of course, I started when I was nine. Um, and the issue that I was working with was the struggle between uh, power um, to one where people were actually creating value for residents, for employees, and for managers. And it's not because I'm a Pollyanna and I wish that people would all just get along very well together, but um, I'm also a political theorist. And like the speakers who have come before me, I could see that there's a connection between the management of a city and the governance structure. So in 1985, I could see the stirrings of an assault on the public sector and on public sector taxation the same way a surfer can see the beginning of a wave form way out there, okay? And that surfer knows it's going to take a while, but that wave is just going to be a monster when it hits the shore. Well, the perfect wave has hit a number of cities, um, and Detroit is one of the ones that's been inundated by it. But the question is, first, what created the tsunami? And I think it's really important to remember that this uh, table up here tells you why it is um, there has been a reduction in the amount of taxation going from the state to the city, um, as the first speaker said. Uh, the truth of the matter is that in our country, and this is federal dollars, but in federal tax, but in our country, we have progressive income tax. We all think that's a really good idea. But in the last 20 years, income and wealth have so migrated to such a small percentage of the population that they are quite right when they say they pay the vast majority of taxes. Because we have essentially a shrinking middle class, which used to pay the bulk of taxes, a very large working and poor group, and a 1% that pays almost 37% of all taxes paid to the federal government. Okay? But if you take a look at the top 10%, Okay, people making over $112,000 a year, 
which is not great riches, right? I would say probably a tenured U of M faculty member is approaching that in some fields, but certainly in economics. They pay that top 10%, 70% of all taxes to the federal government. Now, you can understand that people like me who are real liberals would say, well, that's because they make most of the money, right? And from their point of view, they say, look, $112,000 isn't a lot, and we're carrying a big share of the load. And so the assault on taxation comes because the shift in wealth and income have made it such that a very small percentage of the population is carrying the services essentially for a vast bulk of the population. And they are abandoning the majority. And the second point is, I think uh, the congressman said this earlier, so all uh, great minds are thinking alike, people don't vote. And so if you take a look at the last state election in Michigan, data-driven Detroit tells us that 30% um, of the population of Detroit voted. Now that suggests that statewide elected officers who are making demands on the city don't feel the pinch from the people of Detroit to when they make those decisions. So the combination of seeing it as a sinkhole for other people's tax dollars and not a bountiful basket of potential votes essentially shifts the power enormously away from the golden age of public sector municipal services that we have thought about in the past. So I just want to say that I only have a few minutes left, so I just want to say that um, I uh, focus on process. And for that reason, I find it, like some of the other speakers, extremely disconcerting that all the proposals being floated here have absolutely no focus on the process. How are you going to get from where you are to where you're going? And most importantly, how is what you do going to increase the capacity for self-governance and the economic and civic health of the city. My issue is labor relations. So I pick up the Detroit Free Press yesterday and I see an interview with the chief of police. And I bring this to you. He says, when asked, are you worried about state intervention in Detroit, I worry about it from the standpoint of how contractual changes imposed without negotiations would affect the morale of officers who actually do the work on the streets. And here's the next and important point. The unions have been tremendous in coming to the table and coming up with tentative agreements. They came as partners and morale is a big part of what they do. Okay. So I'm not talking about let's kumbaya, get together, and feel good. I'm saying that in order to create value from the working relationships that you have, the institutional relations of the labor unions and the people who do the work, both um, the hourly employees who are represented and the managers, have to be part of the process of redesigning how that value is going to get cre created. And it has to be something more than simply suspension of collective bargaining agreements. I'd like to suggest that in the many other cities I've worked in, Philadelphia under the Rendell administration, in Providence, Rhode Island, in many water districts um, that I try to help stay public, the important issue that I learned is that the international unions are very familiar with this issue and have a lot of expertise in helping to craft collaborative processes to keep services public and to keep public employees on the job. It is in their interest to have a revenue stream that keeps their members at work. And they are very realistic about how to do it. 
I would say that local politics may have made people feel that this is impossible, but I can tell you that the international unions can support their local leadership in making sure that this can get done. Very quickly, let me tell you, if you're interested in the free books, oh, this is, seems to me to be where we are, right? As long as we have each other, we'll never run out of problems, right? Um, Um, if you Google my name, the first, um, if you Google my name, the first uh, uh, result will be um, a link to my web page. Uh, the second result will be a list of these publications. These are all free. The first one is Working Better Together, how public sector union officers, managers, and elected officials can create value for the public sector by working together. The second one is a list of projects that we did to create public savings, improve the quality of services in a whole bunch of cities and counties around the United States. So if anybody needs any evidence that it can be done, um, they are there. I, I just want to say that um, Jimi Hendrix said that knowledge speaks, but wisdom listens. Okay, so I think that in the course of this day, there have been a lot of knowledgeable speakers coming. I really hope that those words will fall on the wise of Detroit, because I know that they're out there, to demand not just the money and not just the power, but the process that is going to help, help deliver a city that embodies the values that people here so dearly care about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kabuli. And of course, if you Google my name, uh, you find a lot of information about my famous acting career. Um, <laughs> Was that right? Uh, uh, next, we have Councillor Santiel Jenkins. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Council Member Santiel Jenkins. I'm not sure why I was asked to be <laughs> a part of this, what we have to offer. <laughs> it couldn't be that we're going through this process as we speak, right? Um, I am I'm, I'm happy to be here. I have to say how pleased but surprised I was to hear Mr. Stampler's comments. Um, and I think they were right on point. You know, an emergency manager is not the solution. Certainly, Detroit is in a fiscal crisis. Um, just to give you some historic numbers, in 1972, Detroit had 23,500 businesses in the city of Detroit, most of them manufacturing businesses, large and small plants. Um, today, we have less than 9,000 businesses. Most of them not large and small manufacturing plants. Most of them service industry jobs. We all know that service industry jobs pay much less than manufacturing jobs. And I wanted to start with that point to highlight what has already been said. This problem didn't start yesterday. It didn't start two years ago or four years ago. This didn't start with Kwame Kilpatrick or Dennis Archer. This has been going on, or Comey Young for that matter for a very, very long time. And just like we didn't get to this point overnight, we won't fix it overnight, whether we have a mayor and city council or an emergency manager. Because the problems are much more complex than we're being led to believe. <clears throat> and you've already heard about some of our short-term and long-term liabilities, um, which just add to the point of how complex these matters are. I won't repeat them. But I would agree that some of it is, it doesn't matter whose fault it is. As an elected official, it's my responsibility. You know, as the mayor, as city council, it's our responsibility, regardless of whether it started in 2012, 1972, or 1872, it's our responsibility to fix it. I won't dispute that the city, our labor costs are through the roof. We have to find a way to bring our labor costs in line, and that's not because we're paying workers, you know, a million dollars. 
That's certainly not the reason. You know, people who work for the city of Detroit are not getting rich, no matter what your title or position is. What we do have that is very rich is a health care plan and a pension plan that we have not, where we have not kept up with our revenues. Right now, our labor costs, are, our, I'm sorry, our benefits costs are 108% of salary. 108% of salary. So the few people, and there are very few people in the city of Detroit who do make $100,000 the cost of the city is $208,000. So that is unsustainable. Nobody in city government disputes that. Not whether they're union or non-union, nobody in city government disputes that. You know, the, the difficulty comes in talking about how we reduce that cost. Do we reduce that cost through cutting the pension and health care for retirees? And by the way, we have about double the number of retirees that we do of people who are actually working, which as you know, creates another dynamic because we're, we're paying for more people than we have working and the fewer people we have contributing to the system, the more expensive it is for those who are, if that makes sense. Um, so nobody in the city of Detroit is denying that we have to reduce our labor costs. We need to be more efficient. You know, we need to reduce the number. Some departments we have, we may or may not need. We can consolidate departments, and there are some that I, as an individual, would say we don't need, but that's a decision that needs to be made collectively. As Dr. Kabulian said, multi-stakeholder problem solving, right? <laughs> two heads are better than one, ten heads are better than two, you know? So we all have to come together to figure out how to solve this problem. You know, we need more efficiencies, we need to improve the service, the quality of the services we provide, and certainly our long-term debt is an issue. But I haven't met one person who has the answer to all of those problems, which is inherently the problem with Public Act 4. You put one person in charge who is running everything. You know, so the, the thought, the mindset, from my perspective behind this bill is there's a belief that you can find a person with a magic pill who understands how to fix long-term debt. They understand how to provide quality city services. They understand labor and labor, I was gonna say labor negotiations, but they don't need to understand negotiations because they have the power to eliminate any collective bargaining agreements. But the thought behind Public Act 4 is if there's one man, one single line of accountability, then we can fix it. And as Mr. Stampler said, and who knows this better than I do, it doesn't work. It just, it doesn't work. In fact, oftentimes it has left a city in worse shape than when the emergency came. Certainly DPS had a surplus when they were originally taken over by the state. They haven't had a surplus since, not since the first year that they were taken over by the state. You know, so the, thought that Public Act 4 is the answer, not the democratic process. And democracy is ugly. We can all agree that there have been people elected in the city of Detroit who may not have been the best person for the job, but I would say there have been people elected all over this state, all over this country, on every single level, who were not qualified or not prepared to do the job they were doing, period. It's not a Detroit unique thing. But the reality is the voters here, the residents here, decided who they wanted. You know, when they're tired of people, they'll get rid of them. That's why we live in a democracy. And throwing out the democratic process, eliminating people's ability to decide who will make decisions for them, good and bad, who will make decisions for them, is not the American way. So Public Act 4, some of the things that it allows for um, an emergency manager is authorized to reject, modify, or terminate the terms of an existing contract or a, or a collective bargaining agreement. And once again, as the good doctor said, if the people working for the city of Detroit don't feel good about what they're doing, then what do you think the quality of the services will be? They won't be very good. 
So, and I, and I think there are some things in our collective bargaining agreements that we certainly have to change. We, we have to, you know, but it's got to be both sides. Some of the things that I've seen in our contracts, I look at it and I say, what? Was the city negotiator sleep? I don't understand. But the, the unions gave something up to get whatever that was. So it's still got to be a back and forth of negotiation. The unions are at the table. We have some tentative uh, collective bargaining agreements on the table right now, and we're working through this. We're working through it. <clears throat> what we need from the state and what every city in financial distress across the state needs is for state government to work with us, not to come in and tell us what to do. We need them to work with us. We need for the state as the state treasurer has done, to acknowledge that they are part of the problem. In 2001, the city of Detroit got about $360 million in state revenue share from the state of Michigan, 2001. Last year, we got about $140 million. Now, we entered an agreement in the 90s that said, we won't increase our taxes as long as you continue to provide us with state revenue share. Well, we've lived up to our end of that agreement because we had to. The state law didn't change for us. However, the legislators decided, well, you know, it's tight in Lansing, so instead of us tightening up our belts, we'll just reduce the amount of money we're sending to Detroit and to cities all over the state. Detroit just, we got the biggest hit. So we went from $360 million to about $140 million. Our expenses didn't decrease only the amount of revenue sharing. Our revenues didn't increase. Our biggest revenue pot certainly didn't increase because our hands are tied by the state. We can't increase our taxes. So state, you are certainly culpable in the situation that we face today. And again, I started with, we have our problems. We're working on that. But they weren't caused just by Detroiters. So now state who based on Public Act 4 when it was passed, was also financially distressed. You know, and through some miracle, they happened to find hundreds of millions of dollars. But they had a deficit when Public Act 4 was passed. And they met almost every single criteria in the bill. I guarantee you, nobody would have supported the federal government coming in to take over the state of Michigan. Why is it allowable for municipalities? It's, it's, it, and again, I think it needs to be a partnership. We need help from the state, but you have to recognize your culpability, we'll recognize ours, and then we work out the solutions together. The Emergency Manager Act also allows for um, an EM to order a millage. So not only the thought is they'll decrease the debt, but they actually have the ability to increase the long-term debt by ordering a millage. They have uh, the power to uh, dissolve or disincorporate a municipality. So in theory, the financial manager, the emergency manager, and it was changed from emergency financial manager to emergency manager because now they don't just control the finances, they control everything. Imagine one man or woman being able to decide whether Pontiac should remain a city whether Detroit should continue to exist as a city. I mean, that's, I, in my mind, is ludicrous, and it's not anything I ever learned about in civics. So it's, I mean, there are just some things that are inherently wrong with this bill. Um, I don't know how much time I have. Oh, stop. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Thank you very much to all of our panelists for your uh, different and yet in, in many ways convergent perspectives on this important problem.